Hello, I'm John Sigenthaler. Welcome to One on One. It's a conversation with a distinguished citizen of our city about the important issues of the day. And our guest today is Nicholas Zeppos. He's the eighth chancellor of Vanderbilt University. Welcome, Nick Zeppos, to One on One. John, it's a privilege to be here. Uh, it's a great privilege for us to have you here. Um, you know, it's been a couple of years now since you were named interim chancellor. Uh, I guess you've had an anniversary as the official chancellor, the eighth chancellor of Vanderbilt. Um, and I think everybody is wondering, given the economic downturn, what's the future for higher education? Uh, private education, certainly, but you must have some views about public education as well. Yes, I think we're going through a particularly challenging period of time, John, for public education, but particularly uh, private universities and some of the wealthiest universities that I say are no longer quite as wealthy are going through major layoffs, restructuring. But I believe that education, these universities are going to have to adjust, and we're adjusting, but our role is so important in society, John, because it really is still the foundation of the American dream, serving the community, and educating these youngsters and sending them out to be leaders. So uh, we're going through a dramatic change process at Vanderbilt, University of Tennessee, uh, all over the country. But our mission is so important and our work is so noble that you know we've got to get our costs in line and to move forward. What's your, I mean, you know, you were, you were provost before you were chancellor. Uh, you were a distinguished teacher in the law school before you were provost. Um, you've been at Vanderbilt, it's been a part of your life now for long enough for, to ask the question, what's your vision? for this university. Yeah. My vision for this university is going back to the fundamental mission of teaching, discovery, and the dissemination of knowledge, and ultimately the service of society. And I think the most important thing that we need to focus on is what is the impact of Vanderbilt in the Nashville community, Tennessee, and our nation and the world. Let me take an example. I really believe that in my time as chancellor, I wanna say with all of the talent, all of the facilities we have on our campus, that healthcare in America was made more available, more accessible, and much more efficient by a number of institutions. And Vanderbilt was one of them. Um, so I would like to see areas of uh, energy in the environment, health care, uh, religion, where Vanderbilt is following its core mission of education and the discovery of knowledge, but then the impact in the real world is tangible, and that Vanderbilt, in my time, with the work of everybody else, is one of those institutions that people say, that is an institution that st stood up and helped our nation and our world move forward through some very, very formidable challenges. When I was um, a young journalist in this town, uh, Vanderbilt would say of itself, oh, we're the Harvard of the South. Uh, you don't bother to say that anymore. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Vanderbilt has uh, come into its own. Uh, and maybe Duke is the Harvard of the South, but Vanderbilt is the Vanderbilt of the nation. Well, well, you know, the thing I'm very uh, pleased about is I came to Vanderbilt 22 years ago, and I felt what a privilege to join this great university community. My wife and I have raised our family in Nashville. We love the city, and it was great when we came. And I think what I find most exciting is Obviously, in an institution that educates and discovers and disseminates knowledge, you'll see change. I mean, we've decoded the genome, we've done so many things in the university setting, but yet I still feel like it's the Vanderbilt I came to, that there's that genuine connection to the South, Nashville, and that we didn't change to get 
more visibility, better faculty, more students, they started saying, what a jewel this place is. And I have seen city after city, uh, Washington, D.C. area, Philadelphia, New York, Denver. Uh, I got an email from, from some people in Boston saying Vanderbilt is the hottest thing in Boston. I don't know how the Red Sox were doing that day. <laughs> I might have lost two out of three to the Yankees. But uh, I, I just feel so good that we've always kept our genome and our traditions and our values, and people want to be part of the special Vanderbilt that – I loved when I came. I think we're about community. I think we're about values. I think we're about integrity. I think we're about those friendships that form among students and faculty. And that's the connection that people want. Academics, of course, very important. There are a lot of great universities. But I think what I'm very pleased to see is that the Vanderbilt character is drawing people that we're not a Harvard of the South, a Duke of Middle Tennessee, we're Vanderbilt, and people want that. And so it's great. It's very, we had almost 20,000 applications for 1,500 spots this year. Phenomenal. Yeah, and, and it's just, but people want to come here because of who we are and what we stand for. So much of that depends upon recruiting distinguished faculty members. I mean, you yourself. Uh, went through that. Uh, the magnet caught you. Um, talk about how that process works. How is Vanderbilt seen as a magnet to distinguish faculty members who may be uh, in great universities elsewhere, but you've, you've gotten some of them here? Right. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, the University is really made of people. The staff who come there every day to take care of the patients, work with the kids, the faculty and the students. We're a human capital entity. The buildings are beautiful. I love the trees. But if you don't have the people right, you really are not meeting your aspirations. So um, I would say from my standpoint, I'm not quite as active a recruiter as some of the coaches, although, sure. but I love recruiting students and I love recruiting faculty. I love recruiting staff and talking about this university. I think we have a number of things going for us. And I just, uh, we recruited a guy to, from Harvard who's the head of, uh, of, of ENT, great guy. And he's my poster child. Every time I see him, he's got a smile on his face. And I said, what is it, Ron? Tell me. He said, people want to collaborate here. People want to discover together. It's not competitive. It's partnership. It's synergy. It's I didn't think of that. And that does not happen in all the great universities of the world. It might be, I'm doing great work. You're doing great work. Let's see whose work is better. That doesn't happen at Vanderbilt. Uh, so I think, you know, people tend to see universities as, oh, there's just these private universities. We all have our own culture. We all have our own values. And ours really is stunning to people. Then if you think of the collaborations that can occur, I was over uh, taking a uh, spending some time with some of our neuropharmacology people yesterday. And they're in there with chemistry professors, biological science professors. The opportunity for collaboration is culturally and geographically unparalleled in an American university. So I think that's a major. And I, when I recruit somebody, I said, this is a different place. You have to come drink the water. You will taste it. The second thing is... Um, I tell faculty, I promise you, you will do your best work here. That you will, you came into this to make a discovery, to make a difference teaching. You will do it best here. The other thing I have to say is Nashville is a huge positive. And, you know, obviously I came, I really didn't know much about it. My brother-in-law went to Vanderbilt. But, um, you know, in the old days, you know, maybe there was some charm to being in New Haven and New York City and Cambridge and Princeton. 
people want to be in a city. And they want to be in an interesting city with a high quality of life, with a bold vision for its own future. And, you know, there are great college towns, Madison, Ann Arbor, Berkeley, Athens. But we're a great city that gives my faculty colleagues a sense of dynamism and excitement and diversity and culture. So Nashville is a huge plus. And I you know, bow to no president of Yale or Harvard or Princeton saying, well, we're in Nashville. It is um, a tremendous asset. Uh, we have a lot of couples, both professionals. And maybe in the old days it was, you know, maybe the, 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 the husband went to work and the wife stayed at home. It was okay to be in a small town. Now, you know, Mom's a radiologist, dad's a, a biology professor. Where does that work? So, Nashville. So, you recruit a family, really? Yeah, well, I, I, you know, I have to tell you, I recruited this brilliant uh, political science professor, and not only did I recruit him, recruit his family, and uh, darn, I found a house on my street for him to buy. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, he's my neighbor. <laughs> well, you know, you talk about, <clears throat> about recruiting and the importance of getting quality faculty. Uh, at the same time, you've had two transitions in your two prof in two leading professional schools right the medical center um, and uh, and the law school right uh, and in both cases uh, you promoted uh, as you were promoted internally right uh, many people would have said why not a national search uh, talk about how you find those successors and know they're there and right. know they're competent to take over. Right. I think it was a very, very good question. I was hired as a professor from a national search. I was hired as the chancellor from a national search. Um, I always say that there are kind of three types of universities. And when I came, I would say Vanderbilt was kind of in one group, which was there's nobody here who's good enough. Let's look out at Harvard or Princeton or Duke or Yale because we need that to kind of get where we want to be because we're just not that good. Um, then there's the other type of university on the other extreme, which is don't ever ask us to hire an outsider. We are always going to promote within. And we don't do national searches. And you can imagine what those schools are where they're going to say, we just would never bring an outsider in. Um, then there are schools in the middle. And those are the schools that kind of exercise what I say, good judgment, thoughtful succession planning, with a careful eye on growing internal talent, but also being aware of when is a national search required, when is it not? So for example, I'm doing a national search right now for a new chief financial officer and hope to make that appointment soon. Um, on the medical center and the law school, we decided that we needed to start to do succession planning as a matter of best practices. There's not a American business enterprise that doesn't say, well, who's coming in? What's the, the, the bench like? So um, actually, as the new chancellor, I was directed by my board of trust. We need to get on succession planning. And there's actually a big debate among universities. You need to start getting better at this. So my board said to, to me, you start looking at the vice chancellors and the deans. And if you have people that you can promote, particularly in a position like the medical center where it's more than two-thirds of the budget. And when you look at Medicare revenue and other sources of NIH funding, it's the most sensitive to kind of risk. So we did succession planning. And we decided where do we have the talent internally? Where do we not have the talent internally? And then we made what I like to say is a good judgment on the facts is when do you do external? When do you do an internal promotion? Uh, Chris Guthrie, who's the dean of the law school, phenomenal. He could be a dean anywhere. Uh, he's turned down other deanships. You know, I always can assess Jeff Balzer, the medical dean, center, medical center dean and vice chancellor for health affairs. Uh, Jeff has been recruited for that position. 
over the last five years at some of the best medical centers in the country. So a, a good sense of your own team, a good sense of your judgment about the institution, a good sense of the need for continuity, reduction of risk, all come into play. And so National Search sometimes, Carol Endeavor, a Dean of Arts and Science, she was an internal appointment, she came through a National Search. So I have full confidence in these two appointments. And um, you know, it's good to have some new blood. Matt Wright, our Vice Chancellor for Investments, he's here two years, and a little bit of experience in there too. You know, you talk about the board. Um, you have the uh, chairman of your board, Martha Ingram, uh, Nashvilleian, uh, as you know, from Charleston, South Carolina, and goes back to Charleston occasionally, uh, uh, and recently for Spoleto, uh, where she has played such a key role for so long. But um, talk about how important it is to have leadership at the board level. Yeah. Well, I, I really think it is absolutely critical that as you look at a complex institution that at every level you're saying you know how good is that department chair how good is that department how good is that dean how good is that vice chancellor how good is the chancellor you can't then stop and say we're done the ultimate stewards fiduciaries kind of supporters of the university are on the board of trust and we have been blessed with some very strong chairs. Um, I will say that Martha Ingram, I talk to my colleagues all the time, you know, a little bit of discussion behind closed doors about working with their boards. I've got the best board and the best board chairman in the country. And their fiduciary role is so important and they play it better than anybody. They're attuned to what is the role of a board member? Martha and the board never want to come in and say, well, I'm going to manage this unit for you. So it is fundamental. And you can really take a university off its tracks by weak leadership. And it has actually happened in some universities. So it's, uh, we have a great board. And I think Martha is the uh, Tiger Woods, the Michael Jordan, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of, of board chairman. Let me uh, talk to you about uh, students. You know, we talk about universities uh, now in terms of the diversity of the students. And for such a long time, um, if you talk about diversity in the um, in sort of the contemporary sense, you're talking about uh, ethnic diversity, you're talking about religious diversity. But there is also a question of geographic diversity. Nashville and Vanderbilt for so long were looked upon as uh, this is Davidson County School and if your kids are raised here, they're going to try to go there if mm -hmm. they can pass the admission. Now you look on that campus and there is Diversity of every kind, including geographic diversity. Yeah. It goes back to kind of, I think, the nature of our mission and the changing nature of our mission. At the core, we're bringing in these youngsters at age 18. And I have children, you have raised a son, you have hopes and dreams for them to go out into the world and maybe not be famous, maybe not be rich. It'd be great, but make a path to make the world better make America better, make their community better. Well, what's that community going to look like? And who are going to be your colleagues? And who are going to be your friends? Who's going to be your boss? Who might be your constituents? And so we believe that the diversity of the institution is fundamental to our core mission. Um, I have a view which is every university and college is local. And I always say one of the greatest local universities is Columbia University. Wow. And I remember taking my kid for a college tour and, you know, we'd say to people, where are you from? Well, we're from the Bronx. We're from, you know, Midtown. We're from the East Side. And, and I, I think every university is going to draw from that local community. 
if you don't draw from the local community, you will not get kids to come from long distances. So I always view it as concentric circles. Are the best kids in Nashville from the schools saying, there's a school down my street, but it's one of the best in America. It's the best in the world. I'm going to go there. And then that builds, is there a kid in Brentwood, Cheatham County, Middle Tennessee, Memphis, Knoxville, Chattanooga, Jackson, Southeast, America, the world. So I always say you've got to look at the circles and how they're coming together. Um, we're also blessed. I tell people if you look at kind of a demographic, Atlanta, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio are probably four of the ten biggest cities in America. And we are so strong in those cities and they're growing cities and they're what America is becoming that demographically we're so well positioned. Now the interesting thing that has happened has been really the growth of the applicant pool but also then more kids from the mountains, the west coast, the northeast. And um, the mix is great. I teach these kids, John. I always make an effort to teach the freshmen. And you get a kid from Texas saying, I never met anybody from New Jersey. I didn't know they could be nice. And I got, I mean, and that's what education and diversity is about. And I tell the kids, it's all about sameness and difference. You got these differences, learn from them. But ultimately, you're blessed with these talents. You're at Vanderbilt. You're a human being. Find the commonality in all that we do together. Talk about uh, the impact of uh, a national, really an international economic downturn and how it affects a privately endowed institution like Vanderbilt. Yeah, uh, I would say that the fall uh, that we had and my colleagues at public and private university, particularly those with the large endowments had, um, we could not escape what I considered a financial maelstrom and I really believe that uh, whatever actions were taken in the fall were absolutely necessary. I do believe that we were close to the abyss. Um, what it required universities to do was to start saying our endowments are not going to grow that much and we better get our costs in line. The nice thing about Vanderbilt is on the one hand we have got a very nice endowment but on the other hand we're not 50, 60, 70 percent dependent on the endowment like some of our peers. Our mix of money coming in, tuition, endowment, medical uh, uh, revenues, NIH, NSF, Department of Education funding at my number one rated uh, school of education over here, um, we had a little bit more diversity um, in the revenue streams, but we started really kind of moving very cautiously. And um, we slowed down capital projects and we slowed down some hiring. We still hired faculty and essential staff. One thing I'm very proud of, John, is we opened up our 100 Oaks. And um, I think we probably hired about 800 new staff down there, probably hired another 150, 200 doctors. So I feel like we were affected, but I care deeply about Nashville and the Nashville economy and that we were able to continue growing and employing and bringing people to this great community made me feel like, well, maybe there is a little bit of a silver cloud there, silver lining to the cloud. <clears throat> but we've trimmed our spending and uh, I tend to be uh, focused on every dollar is for the staff, the students <clears throat> and the faculty. And we didn't have to do any large layoffs. Harvard continues to do large layoffs, Stanford. So I'm very proud of how our university, I think we're very well positioned for the future. But um, let's just say Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's were not as relaxing at the Zeppos household as they, <laughs> as they, as they usually are. You know, you and I sit here, and we know that... Uh, on the other side of those camera lens uh, are a number of um, suffering Vanderbilt fans who live and die on the basketball court and on the gridiron. 
and die is what they have done too often in their own minds. Uh, what does a chancellor do to uh, deal with uh, fans who uh, are interested in uh, parking for the faculty, uh, sex for the students, that's <laughs> what Clark Kerr said years ago, oh, yeah. and athletics yeah. for the alumni. What, do you, what about Vanderbilt's athletic program? Yeah. I mean, David Williams, I think, has yeah, done a great David, job. Yeah, you've you got to give David uh, tremendous credit. Uh, you know, Gordon made a pretty bold move. And, Gordon Gee, your predecessor. Yeah, my predecessor, and kind of collapsing them. And, you know, I've been at Vanderbilt since 1987, and, you know, I love sports, and you know, I started taking my kids to the football games, basketball games. You know, I grew up, you know, Big Ten football, watching the Green Bay Packers. And I had never seen people who were so content, actually, with maybe putting up the good fight and not winning. And winning isn't everything, but, you know, I go to, I used to go to every game. I don't care if we're playing Kentucky in basketball, Alabama football. It's like, we're going to win this one. And so I was a little bit one of those discouraged fans as well. So um, David really has done an outstanding job. But I will tell you, there's a partnership with uh, David Williams, uh, the provost Richard McCarty, um, the people in development to do it the right way. Get good kids, have them love Vanderbilt, get the education, and heck, play the most competitive sports you can, SEC sports. So I tell people, you know, if I win a Nobel Prize or I win an SEC football championship, I don't know what people would kind of say to me was the most exciting thing. But uh, I just tell you, I got great coaches. I've got David there. I work for the coaches. I work for David. I support them. I try to recruit players for them, get the kids in, talk about Vanderbilt. But it's a thrill. I mean, I can go to Starbucks. I can go to Kroger and not have people say to me, are you ever going to win some football games? Well, my neighbor is Coach Johnson. Yeah, I was going to say, you got Bobby you, Johnson down you, around the street. You got Bobby down Every down time we win, I go by and blow the horn and yeah. let him know we're, yeah. we're there, you know. Yeah. Talk, Nick. Uh, 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 we have about a minute left, and uh, and I I just uh, uh, think about uh, Vanderbilt and 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 the future. Um, is there something uh, in the back of your mind that you'd like to do uh, to really sort of uh, set Vanderbilt aside and and and, and separate it from what's called uh, the pack of great yeah. institutions. Yeah. I think you see it in, a, in, in three areas, John. The number one is I think this notion of friendship, community, and now access to Vanderbilt, we've eliminated all debt for undergraduates. Um, the freshman commons that we've built, a new freshman campus that, again, focuses, academics is great, but we've brought the faculty back to the campus and talked about values and friendship and community. I worry very much that in this drive toward efficiency and get the kids in, get the kids out, that there have got to be some schools that say this is a four-year transformative experience for your 18-year-old. And it is. I mean, so I really believe that the values and the inculcation of values and integrity to the students in a residential setting is going to set Vanderbilt about. There are only going to be a few of us that do that. Um, the second thing is health care. I, I really believe that our ability with an integrated university is going to make us a leader. The third is I would like to see our research translate more into the local economy. I ran out of time on research. Okay. Thank you so much for coming, Nick Zepos. Thank you, John. It's a privilege to be here. 